Thanks for joining us on another episode of the 47th Hour. I'm Toby, and joining me on this nostalgic deep dive into the science fiction and fantasy archives are my co-hosts, Steve and Guy. Now, before we take a look at what we've been watching, we have some cancellation updates. Are you ready for this, guys? Go on, okay. All right, Guy, I want you to raise a glass, all right, and I want you to cheer as loud as you can. That woman has been put out of his misery by the CW. They have axed it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, so relieved that that's not going to be inflicted upon anybody anymore. <laughs> it was just, it was just bad. We, we've, we've discussed it in previous episodes. Yeah. It was just bad. It was. It was. We haven't got to bother watching that anymore. Thank God. There's just too many things wrong with it. There's part of me that thinks the only reason they've axed it is because they've got this, is it Gotham Knights that's in development? Ah. If it was anything like Harlem Knights, it's going to be bloody terrible. Okay, that's a very random link there, guy. I like it. <laughs> Do you remember Harlem Knights? Yeah, the less said about that, the better, really, guy. So is this like um like a spin-off from Go- the Gotham series? I'm not 100% sure on it, but I know that they're casting. Uh, it's like a reboot again. So Batman's, I think Batman's died in it. And it's a couple of people getting together. I think Robin's in it, and I'm not sure. I've really not read too much about it because I was worried that it was going to be set in the same universe as Batwoman. And I thought, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm not going to be interested in, you know, Gotham Knights. But I'm going to have to have a look at it now, I think. Check up on it, see what it's like. Yeah, I think I will. CW has also given the chop to another show. Whilst I'm happy they act Batwoman, I am absolutely outraged that they have axed Legends of Tomorrow. Oh, why? I don't get it. It's one of their top rated shows. Someone asked for a pay rise. It's season seven. I think they just aired. So I think season eight would have been the next one, which I'm sure means contract negotiations were up. it does. So I imagine there were some pay rises. They usually contract up to the end of season seven, and that's why most shows end at season seven. The CW is basically up for sale as a network in America. So they're kind of cutting a lot of um, expensive things to make themselves look a bit more um, appealing, I think. You hashtag Elon Musk on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Elon Musk is like, I'm a fan of Stargirl. I'm going to renew it for 10 seasons. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, but um, things like Stargirl, I think Lois and Clark and The Flash all have a season renewal before these announced um and everyone was worried why these two hadn't been announced yet so i think a lot of people knew it wasn't going to be good but you know we do have other shows on air so i'm hoping that the legends can kind of crop up in like a two-part flash special just to finish their story because it ended on a cliffhanger i haven't seen it but i know the last season ends on a cliffhanger which is really annoying when you have a show that's gone for seven seasons and it just gets axed i mean have you ever seen legends steve nope Oh, you are missing out. The Superman show is really, really good. It's got a nice budget. Stargirl is a great show. It's got that 80s vibe. It's distinct as well. It stands out from the rest. You've got The Flash and you've got Arrow and that. They did what they needed to do. They were great shows for the period, for the era. Um, I think Flash has gone on too long myself. I think it's very samey, samey, repeat, repeat, repeat. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, Legends of Tomorrow... It just has fun. It takes the mick out of itself and out of the other shows. I mean, they have big blue furry monsters fighting dragons and magic. And it's just crazy. Absolutely crazy. One of the main guys, Steve, he has his nipple bitten off by a unicorn. And then later on, it comes back as a magical, mystical nipple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the show you can watch, you don't need to take drugs and you're to like... watch. <laughs> And you're like, who writes this stuff? You're like, this is really bad, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and it became this little show, like almost like a little show that could. It really punched above its weight. It shouldn't have been at the level it was, but people, fans just loved it. There were a lot of tertiary characters in a lot of the other series that they just didn't really have any plans or storylines for. So they decided to essentially that they were going to team these people up. This bloke recruited these guys and said, look, the reason you've been recruited is because you make no impact on the world at all. They're really kind of upset by the news, but he said, the reason why I've recruited you is because now you can make an impact. 
you can actually make a difference. You can hunt down this evil villain. I really can't remember his name. Anyway, so they like band up and get together and, and all of them have their individual traits and, and the way that they work together is, is really quite fun it, at times. It spirals from there, really, and it gets it gets better and better. You think that, oh, maybe maybe it's peaked, but actually, you know what? the writers just have fun with it and it's just really, really enjoyable to watch. One girl in it and she's like an FBI agent and she really reminds me of um, Olivia from Fringe to look at and some of the stuff she does i'm like olivia would do that it's got is it the first one or first two seasons the actor who plays sydney bristow's dad oh from the flash series that's it um, yeah garber he he's in it and he's quite fun because he's one half of a hero and when they kind of combine they become this i can't remember his name it's been so long since i've seen it maybe that's the problem because not many people are watching it live they're going do you know i'll watch it when it finishes and binge watch it. Um, Firestorm, they become Firestorm. That's yeah. it, Firestorm, yes. It's well written. And the fact that they can travel anywhere they want in their little spaceship at any time. And they can go around the galaxy if they really want to. They tend to stay around Earth. Absolutely. It's all the tip of my tongue as to the name. Randall, Randall Savage. No, that's not <laughs> Randy Savage. <laughs> Vandal Savage, Vandal Savage. That's his name, not Randy Savage. Yeah, and it's got the Hulk in it. It's great. <laughs> One of the main characters is a uh, trained assassin. Really, isn't she? That, I, that's the best way to describe her. She kicks some absolute ass throughout. So, uh, oh, you'd like it, Steve. Now it's finished. Wait for it to appear on some sort of service and then binge watch it. Yeah, I'll wait for it to come on Netflix or something. I want to say it's on Now TV and Sky in the UK, oh, but... I have Now TV. And one more piece of news. Netflix has given the axe to Steve Carell's Space Force. Have any of you seen that? No. Yes. And I'm not surprised. The thing is, right, the pilot, you're just watching him walk around an empty station for about 30 minutes. And it's just not fun. It takes absolute ages just to get to one massive punchline right at the end of the episode and it's just not funny oh is that the um chinese satellite yeah yeah okay that's kind of funny but you took so long to get there and you just think well, oh don't no i don't want it that's the thing is i came back to it like um a month later watched episode two and it was still doing the same thing is episode. steve Carell? playing the same cringy person he's playing in the office because i haven't seen it no right no no okay so he's playing a di different character altogether with, with no cringiness that type thing there's a slight cringeworthy factor but it's not the same oh okay i just wondered if he'd been shooed into being who he was because he was so successful in the u.s office we are led to believe he's playing the character but actually he's playing steve Carell. ah Yes, that's what I was going to say. That's kind of his go-to. I get the feeling it was announced shortly after Trump announced his Space Force. So I think it was kind of a reaction to that. <laughs> we have the news from the BBC that they have cast the 14th Doctor, Shuti Gatwa. And he's been in Sex Education. I think that's the thing on Netflix with Gillian Anderson. What do we think of this casting? Uh, I've not watched a lot of the Sex Education series. Um, Marie watches it, so I, it's been on in the background. So I've seen some of it. Mm. Um, I think he's, I think he's definitely a good enough actor for sure. But then Jody was a good enough actress, so it doesn't really mean anything, does it? In that sense, but the change of the writing staff that will help will him really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, otherwise, if the writing staff didn't change, it would just be different doctors, same staff. Oh, you'd just be polishing it, and there's only so yes. much polishing you can do. Yeah. Um, I think I've seen him, there was a red carpet with Russell T. Davis. I don't know if you've seen that little clip online. I've seen it. Not yet. And Russell stood there behind him like some sort of weird, nervous bouncer. <laughs> and it's almost like he's there to stop this guy from saying anything. I know they haven't filmed yet, but they have done some pre-production so he's probably seen some script uh, 
and he, you know, we don't know what his mouth is like. Uh, like Russell T Davies was very nervous when he was in that. You, it was quite funny to watch. Uh-huh. But seeing him interact, that's the only time I've seen Shooty on anything. Mm. And I can see him as a doctor. I can see it working. It's like he had a, it, like he had an extra ticket for the BAFTAs. And he invited <laughs> his weird uncle. Yeah. You know, it, was, it, was, it was just weird. He was just loitering. And it's like, oh, this is awkward. Someone stepped in on this interview and he's not supposed to be there. <laughs> it's like, it's like you, you said there was going to be donuts. Where are the donuts? <laughs> just, he, wants, just... he wants the food that he's been invited for. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's me. I'm there. I'm like, you said there's donuts. I don't want all this. I just want the food. Take me to the food. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's, been, there's a lot of blurb online. I've already looked. I've gone to I've gone to the places where the, all, all the normal sort of like Doctor Who fans go, and even including the evil places like Reddit. <laughs> um, yes, I agree. It seems to be a very popular pick. Mm, I've seen a few negative videos and stuff, but you just know they don't know what they're talking about. They're probably Jody fans. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is potential to be brilliant. Um, and I think with the, the, the fact is, is that now that we've got um, RTD back um, and with the potential of also uh, Stephen Moffat go, uh, rewriting, uh, um, up, to, up for writing a few episodes, could be brilliant. Mm-hmm. I just I'm looking forward to the fact that because Russell's he's got that new production company and it's all dedicated to Doctor Who. I think it's you wouldn't start up a production company and go all in unless you were doing multiple shows. So I think his idea is he's going to have a first season and in that you're going to see some fantastic characters, maybe one or two returning from his era or Moffat's era or, or whatever. And then they're going to go right now. This is great. I'm going off into my own show. Bang. And you're going to have it might only be one offs or a movie and it might be an old companion that I think he's really going to do what Big Finish do. But he's going to do it for TV. I think he's going to really embrace it. Yep, someone to look forward to. Yeah. Can't get any worse. Definitely. And now for our Hall of Fame. Let's see what awesome nominations we have this week. Steve, would you like to nominate first? Yes. Um I don't have a great nomination, but I have something that um a film that I absolutely love that was panned by the critics. Even the people who made the film don't like it. I'm going to nominate a film called The Fifth Element. I just loved it. I loved everything about it, even though I know everybody else hated it. It's just one of my favourite sci-fi films. Um, Gary Oldman, who was in it, said he wished he hadn't made it. (laughs) That's how bad he thought it was. But I love it. I love um, Bruce Willis in it. The whole Lilu Dallas... Uh, multi-pass yeah I love the whole film I thought it was brilliant right from the start to end even Chris Rock being annoying as he was didn't put me off I love the film and I want to nominate because it's it's one of my favorites but I understand why you might not vote for it um all I'm gonna say right is guy you need to put something on the table that is epic I love the fifth element I love it (laughs) (laughs) the song when that blue girl's yes. singing, the Avatar woman, whatever she's called, she's up on stage yeah. and she's singing. It's a really good beat to it. Yeah. And then you, you super overlay the um the fight going on at the same time to the beat. Yeah, I'm like, it's just great. They're having fun. It's sci-fi. And it's just a really, really good, solid film. Yeah, I, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, Guy, I'm going to make room here for your epic Epic nomination. Almost like I feel we need a drum roll here, guy. Come on. <laughs> da, 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 da. The theme to the X Files, because literally it was just that the, the first opening four notes. It was great. I think this is they released it as a song and it got to I think it got to number one. Yeah. I I, I, I bought the C D yeah, single. I did. But oh God. <laughs> not only that guy. I bought the remix one, but I think it was something like DJ Dado or whatever his name <laughs> Yeah, it's he... And he did like 12 remixes of it. Airwolf, the A-Team, uh, Knight Rider, um, yeah, Thunder of Paradise to a certain extent. They kind of all got like these iconic sort of theme tunes. And X-Files for me was just an, a step above because 
you only really needed to hear those four notes and you were like you were whistling it all day it's very similar to the um buffy as soon as you hear that sort of you're straight in yeah 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 absolutely that particular single was released when there was also cassette tapes available so I actually owned that on cassette tape. <laughs> I thought I was Many bad. years ago. <laughs> yeah, back in the black and white days. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I loved I love the X-Files. And I think the theme tune is, I, like you say, it is iconic. 90% of people, if you were born in the, 90, in the 80s or 90s and you grew up, you knew, you will know that theme tune. There's no yeah. doubt about it. You play... Any part of that team tune, and someone will go, Oh, 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 that's the X Files. Yeah. They're not going to go, Ah, oh, was that Airwolf? Was it Knight Rider? No. 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 You know, yes, if I play the Knight Rider theme tune to most people that like sci fi or were of our age, you will get that that is the Knight Rider theme tune. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But uh, so that's a very, very good nomination, guy. But I will only really consider a voting for it if you can sing the whole theme tune. Sing the theme tune. Wow, I just want you to give give me a whole rendition. Well, uh, well wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Wait, there you go, wait, 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 hold on. There, there were no words. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to imagine that there was words. Imagine that, um, you know, Gillian Anderson or David Duchovny had to sing the theme tune. Oh my god! I, this is not a Jacoe version of the Voyager theme tune. <laughs> what would you imagine Julian Anderson and David Duchovny would have sung over that theme tune? <laughs> Come on, guy! This show is called The X Files <laughs> <laughs> with Mulder and Gurney. <laughs> no, That's pretty awful. I would it be like <laughs> he's Mulder <laughs> and she's Scully? <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Oh, oh god i'm disappointed that, with that effort i gotta say um my nomination wait. is kind of really out the park here like most of your nominations oh, i don't know i think i'm usually on the ball <laughs> usually <laughs> um, i don't think you've heard of it steve so you're probably not even going to remotely consider it for a vote but guy i know you've played it it's the ratchet and clank franchise on the playstation the games i played it Oh, okay. Yeah. So you have played it. Yeah. Steve. Yeah. On PS1. Yeah, I think it I think you know, it's a franchise that's got like 15, 20 games over the PlayStation's like it was on PS1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the portable and the Vita, if you remember them. I think they've got great characters. It's fun, it's humorous, the open worlds. And it's just not that. It's not just the fun and the humor you have, it's the quality of the production in the games. These levels are well designed and well thought out. The PS5 version of Ratchet and Clank looks yep. out of this world. It is. Yeah. It really is. It's the level loading is so quick. You're instantly going between dimensions. And what I really love is the over the top, over the top weapons. Mm. You know, you've got water sprinklers, you've got things that turn to people to sheep, dancing disco balls. I mean, they all have a dance underneath, and you can just pick them off one by one. Uh, you've got massive, massive, like, nuclear bombs. You've got a glove of doom, Steve. You'd love the glove of doom just because of its name, <laughs> let alone what it does. <laughs> One thing that Ratchet and Clank had as, as, as a bonus is, is the fact that it never repeated itself. And that's why it was such an, an appealing sort of set of games to play. The replayability of the game was just like, yeah, I don't mind doing another run through that again. Yeah. It was just, you know, one of those sort of, sort of games that you could do that way. Like when you finish the game, I think my first one was Tools of Destruction and you get to the end of the game and you think, oh, well, I finished it. That's great. And it, would you like to go back into the game? You're like, okay, then, because I've got a few bits to finish off. I want to get the bolt. So I want to carry on, you know, leveling up the weapons. And then it opens up a whole new set of levels for your weapons. So you thought they were max, but they're not max. You don't get the chance to like super max your weapons to the level of ridiculous and by the end of it you'll go around and when i say god mode it, that's an understatement with what you can do in these games <laughs> yeah guy where are you gonna go we all vote now so i've got the fifth element or ratchet and clank the ratchet and clank series was great but i think the casting for the fifth element was just absolutely on the money it was 
the little side characters as well. Lee Evans, the stand-up comedian, is in this film. He's brilliant. His little bit part, brilliant. Aziz Light loved it. <laughs> what a great film. Um, and I, I, I got to say, it, it, it has to go in the Hall of Fame. Fair enough. Me. And Steve? Very difficult. Um, I think I'm going to have to go with the X-Files music. I know Ratchet and Clank, it is sci-fi, but I just feel like in the Sci-Fi Hall of Fame, the X-Files music probably really should go in. I think if I had that choice, I'd be thinking, well, actually, if I took 100 random people and I said, do you know Ratchet and Clank? And do you know the X-Files? Most people will say X-Files, yes. Ratchet and Clank, probably not. So from that point of view, I would have gone with the X-Files. So I agree with that. So it's all down to me here. And I love the X-Files theme tune guy. But I love Fifth Element. Yeah, it is good. And... Oh, if I could put them both in, I would. <laughs> I mean, they literally, literally both for different reasons. We should have a theme music tier thing list of some sort. Oh, that's mm. a good idea. Yeah. And if anyone nominates Lost for that, uh, whatever that was, it's what I think, June. <laughs> or Law and Order. <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hang on, Guy. Do you consider Law and Order sci-fi? Yeah, have you watched it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, some of the crap that they come out with is garbage science fiction <laughs> I'm going to go with Fifth Element alright because it's a sol- I think it's a solid film that is a film I could put on on a Sunday afternoon after Sunday lunch and just enjoy the hell out of it if I was a child and that had been launched it would be my Flight of the Navigator it would be my Tron yeah, it would be my too. you know that kind of film that I grew up with yeah. So, yeah, don't listen to critics. Just like what you like, you know, that's my attitude. So into this week's Hall of Fame is the classic film Fifth Element. So before we nominate our entries for this week's Hall of Shame, let's take a look at some classic episodes of television that were first broadcast in this week in history. First up is the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode, Empok Noor. While salvaging components for DS9's sister ship, the crew find a surprise has been left behind by the Cardassians. Steve, this is one of your top DS9 episodes, well, Actually, yeah? it's my favourite Miles O'Brien episode. Agreed. Because Garrick is so smart, and so you know that there's no way he can outsmart him, but he knows that if he, if he plays to his own strengths he can win the battle. And and evidently that's exactly what he does. And the episode's brilliant because Miles can hear Garrick um, and he he kind of walks down the corridor and he's heard him, he knows he's there. And as he rounds the corridor, he isn't there. The whole mind thing between them both, absolutely brilliant. Probably one of the best standalone episodes Chief O'Brien had anyway, um, as he he was really um, a support character and not really given a lot to do and usually Chief O'Brien was always with Dr. Bashir, usually yes. on, you know, on anything. So this one was really good in that sense that he that Bashir wasn't even on this. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed the episode. I thought it was excellent. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a great decision to put Miles in this episode. They could have easily have gone with Bashir. They could have gone with Cisco, any, you know, a lot of people, yeah. even Kira, with her background yeah. in what she was yeah. doing, et cetera. But to choose Miles, who is the, you you expect him to probably be the most fish out of water in that scenario, actually does really well. And I love his little line where he sets the stuff down and he's like, no, I'm an engineer, and then sets it off. And you're like, just absolutely brilliant. And then there's a tiny exchange at the end. I don't know if you remember this, where Garrick's in sickbay and he says, you know, you did well, kind of thing. You can see in his eyes, he doesn't admit it, but inside, you can think he's got this new level of respect that he didn't realise. He, he knew from, you know, historical accounts that this guy was, wasn't it a warrior of set deck three or five or something like that? I can't remember what it was called. But, you know, he's got a history of killing Cardassians at this moment in time. And Miles is, is open that he was happy to kill Garak at that point. Should it need to be, he, he would have done it. And you can just see in his eyes, he's like, yeah, would you? Brilliant. Love it. Yeah, respect. <laughs> yeah. I also remember 
Gary's gone around and got all the crew members and he's hung them all up and they're all hanging around waiting for him. He's like, they're waiting for you. <laughs> he's teasing her playing with the dead crew members. I can't it's just remember, brilliant. to be honest. Uh, it's been a long time since I watched Deep Space Nine. I haven't even wa- re-watched Deep Space Nine. So yeah, you, you could be right about that. It does sound familiar. Guy, have you seen the episode? You must have seen it. Yeah, it's probably one of the better standalone episodes from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And then Pot Noir was absolutely fantastic. Just to delve a little bit deeper into Garrick's character, to learn a little bit more about the chief that you didn't really know before. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Uh, moving on, in 1999, we have the season three penultimate episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Graduation Day, part one. I love it. I think it, whilst it's not necessarily a classic episode of Buffy in regards to, you know, Monster of the Week, etc., it builds and leads nicely into the season finale part two. Um, plus, you have that epic, epic fight between Buffy and Faith. It's the showdown we have been waiting yeah, for. It's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Angel gets poisoned. Yes. And she's correct. trying to save him, isn't she? Uh, it's just, it's when she stabs her as well. You just don't even expect it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. I, I loved it, graduation day, all of it. Those first three seasons, I've said before in, in previous podcasts, are perfect. I loved mm. everything about Buffy's first three seasons. And even the fourth wasn't that bad, was it was okay. So yeah, graduation day was excellent. I, I enjoyed all of it. The fight scenes were excellent. It's the, you know, Gibby Gang always come through. And it's like, well, yeah. what's the cure? The blood of a slayer. I'm like, how convenient. And Buffy's face, she's yeah. just like, okay, I'm going to go and get one. Because her lover, as she puts it, is a threat, she will now go and take out Faith. And I'm like, you could have done this a while ago, but it's only when Angel's a threat do you actually bother. Up until then, she's like, well, you know, morals and ethics and all that lot now. She doesn't care. Cause she's like, no. Nope. Because Faith had killed <laughs> the assistant mayor at the beginning of season three, right? Oh, early on. Yeah, yeah. It was that's what I mean. So they spent the whole season like, well, you killed a guy, but nobody was doing anything about it anyway. Buffy could have put her in prison. They could have got the evidence together. This is a Scooby Gang. Do you know what I mean? That's what they do. They find yeah. stuff. So um, I love that, but I also love the whole scene in I think it was Angels. I don't want to call it apartment, crypt, cave, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. <laughs> and Wesley comes back and he's like, there's nothing that they can do for you. You know, they, there's no help I can get for you. And then she's just like, well, I need the help now. You go and tell them, the council, I need their help now. And he's like, there's nothing they will do. They cannot help you. They will not break hundreds of years of tradition. And she's like, Okay. Well, go home and tell the council to pack up shop because I quit. I'm like, <laughs> love it. <laughs> this is an episode, I think, where Buffy grows yeah. up. You know, it really is an episode where she is like, Do you know what? I can no longer coast through these things. I've got to act yeah. now. Uh, yeah, I love it. I do. I do. I, and the whole fight sequence is just glorious because it's a long time coming. Those punches really do hit. Um, the only downside is those stunt doubles. I mean, they're like five foot taller than Sarah Michelle Gellar. No offense. <laughs> he is short, isn't she? <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're just like, well, that's a stunt double because all of a sudden she's now taller than Faith and then she's shorter than Faith again. And like, brilliant. Yeah. On to our last one for this week. We've got the Star Trek Enterprise finale. These are the oh voyages. Now. <sighs> I know we don't really rate Enterprise highly <laughs> between the three of us. We don't, we don't um, rate it. Simple. <laughs> but to summarise the episode, you've got William Riker. He's trying to clear his mind. And he, it's the, do you remember the episode of TNG with the Pegasus and the um, cloaking device? And they're looking yeah. for it. And he has to decide whether or not, through the episode, he has to decide whether or not to tell Picard that on this mission they had a cloaking device and it was a breach of the um accords etc but this episode of enterprise is all set on the holodeck and it's riker and diana or diana's helping riker mull the decision over does he tell picard or not 
because he's still got an obligation to adhere to his Starfleet superiors. And he's been told not to tell Picard. So I think in an episode, in a normal episode, I probably wouldn't have had a problem with this. But I think this is a season finale of Enterprise. Yeah. Which is Enterprise's crew. Yeah. But yet they are relegated to the equivalent of holodeck characters in Riker's world. And I find that if I was a lover of Enterprise, I don't hate Enterprise. Don't get me wrong. I will watch it happily. But if I was a massive, massive fan like I am of Voyager, I would be offended by this finale. Yeah, it's, yeah absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. There is no way this should have been the end of the show. Um, I completely mm. agree with you. What a complete letdown for anybody that calls themselves, I've never met one, anybody that calls <laughs> themselves a fan of Star Trek Enterprise. But yeah, you're right. It, they should have done this as the penultimate one, maybe. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I, it was it was very odd. I felt it, it was a very odd way to do things. I've got to, I've got to say, I didn't watch a lot of the Enterprise episodes. They were that bad. Um, I think I've, I've even given up on Discovery to an extent. I, I don't really watch that anymore either. Yeah. Uh, Guy, what, what do you think? It was a cop-out. Yeah. It was an absolute cop-out. Maybe maybe it was the writers that was kind of turning around and saying, oh, well, you're cancelling us. This is what we're going to give you. It wasn't conducive to the rest of the series. No. Nope. It didn't actually make sense with the whole season prior to it, leading up to it, and just a bit of a, a sucker punch, really, for anybody that actually was in you know that had no shame that called themselves an enterprise fan (laughs) for them to witness that as their end is even sad when you say enterprise fan i wouldn't like i said i wouldn't classify myself as a fanatic it's not my favorite star trek show but it does have its pluses you know trip is a great character played very well to is a great Mm. character played very well probably one of my favorite vulcans depending on my mood the zindia was good in an all show, that would have actually gone down well. If Voyager had done a Zindi arc, it would have been brilliant. It's not only the way the show was written and the holodeck, this last episode in the finale. It's the fact that it's only one episode. It's not a feature length episode. And most of it is Riker pretending to be a chef cooking with the rest of the crew to get their gossip so he can help with this idea. I'm like, this is just boring. Spoiler alert. But Trip's okay. death was totally unnecessary. I agree. There were so many ways he could have got around that. Yep. So many ways. And it was just like, do you know what? We need a, a big death so we can use it probably for trailers, I imagine. Yeah, it, it's an episode that if I had to rate it, I would give it less than zero. <laughs> 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 like... Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. Right, so now on to our Hall of Shame. Presume you're both ready, because I know quite often, Guy, you kind of make these up on the spot, don't you? Yeah, I've Excellent. Got one. So I'm going to go first this week. And the simple reason is because we have just talked about it. I want to nominate the finale for Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> that was well done, Toby. <laughs> I know. Brilliant, <laughs> uh, brilliant. So that's my nomination because I don't have to talk about it. We all know we've just done it. Yeah, that is my nomination. Okay. I can't not. We can't discuss it. Yeah, and then enough. go into a hall of shame fair without n- at least nominating it. We can't do that. I'm going to go with the um, Mutant Next TV series. I don't know necessarily that it's the fault of the people that made the series, but it was just everything that went wrong with that show that could go wrong did go wrong. They had lawsuits. They had 20th Century Fox suing Marvel for breach of license. And it went on for years. They actually didn't settle the lawsuit until the series had been cancelled. The series ended on a cliffhanger as well. So it felt like it never had a chance. So I'm, that's why I'm nominating the X-Men. Um, I'm really, I don't know whether really I should nominate either of the, the plaintiffs, Marvel or 20th Century Fox, for not being able to sort these things out. Why didn't they sort it out right at the start? I would say your nomination then is the mishandling of the Mutant X property. Yeah. 
You could have you could have just picked Forbes March as your as your nomination because he was bloody terrible <laughs> all the way throughout that series. Is he the guy that turned into the rock like character? Uh no. Uh yeah, you can alter the density of his body. I, think, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I remember there's there was him. There was the black haired guy that could fire lightning out of his hands. I thought he was yeah. quite cool. Even though the budget for the lightning wasn't great. No. <laughs> but that's because they were spending all the money on lawsuits. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, if he's the one that could do the lightning, are they saying that his character is very like Storm? I yes. Presume? I can see there are similarities, but you've got to remember, like, you can only be so creative with like the, the amount of powers that one person has. Yeah. Did DC start thinking, oh, well, that character can fly. Our character can fly. We're the whole thing was them. 20th Century Fox acquired the rights from Marvel. So it was Marvel's to start with. And then Marvel started getting defensive and saying, oh, no, no, it's nothing to do with our universe. And then later on, even changed their mind and said, that actually, the Mutant X could be set in their universe. Wow. The, the final lawsuits on this were closed two years after the series was cancelled. I watched the first season. I didn't think it was too bad. Budget aside, you know, but not every show is going to have a great budget. Guy, what's your nomination then? So my nomination is a film. It was pretty terrible. A film called The Adventures of Eddie Pooh Murphy. and Ash. Eddie Murphy? Eddie Murphy. Yeah. All I can say, guys, I remember to avoid that. When it was on, I looked at a trailer and I just thought, I don't need to see yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. Same. When Eddie Murphy was cast in this, they're kind of like, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to put in a lot of money. Joe Pantoliano, uh, John Cleese, Pam Greer. Alec Baldwin's in this. I don't get why they made it. I don't get the plot. It absolutely terrible. It it made multi millions worth of loss, um, and I'm not surprised because when I watched it, I just like, is this actually real? Is are we waiting for the real? Is, film that the, is it the nightclub on the moon? Oh, oh god, yeah. I have watched it. Can I nominate both of you for the Hall of Shame for watching that film? <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, do you want to um, give us your vote first this week? Difficult, difficult, because it was an awful film, I admit. And like Guy said, I probably would have asked for my money back. But just the audacity of the Star Trek writers to write that and put it out as the last episode. You can't even make the excuse that it was a shorter, it was a shorter season by two episodes, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. It was only 22, as opposed to like 20. It just felt like to me, like, well, we won't bother with the two-parter we had to finish. We'll just end it there. It's just mm. the worst. It really is. I can't, I just can't believe it. Honestly, that's how you end the series. It was almost like everybody had given up and this was the best uh, a junior writer came up with. And they were like, yeah, we'll just do that. Yeah, the, all the writers had moved on. It was just one guy left in the office going, I've got to write something. Yeah, uh, uh, and this this was it. So um, I have to vote for it because Star Trek is much better than that. Much better. Um, and I just felt it was really half-assed. And I'm a Star Trek fan, and I really Enterprise really wore me down. Discovery has become like that. I'm not even sure I'm going to bother with even finishing the fourth season, let alone debate. You know, I the, I won't even go in for the fifth. So um, because they, it sounds like they've cut the fifth down too. But I'm going to have to vote for the Star Trek uh, Enterprise episode. I can't say I've seen the Adventures of Pluto Nash. I saw the trailer. Knew it wasn't going to be for me. So I think when you nominate it, Guy, I partly think, yes, it's a bad film. It's a bad film. But if you'd have seen the trailer, you would have known it was a bad film and you wouldn't have watched it. So I kind of put part of the blame on you for watching it. <laughs> you could put part of the blame on the, my vegetative state at the time and I really couldn't find the remote. But... <laughs> Blame whoever broadcast it. Yeah, I like that. The Mutant X thing, you've got all these writers, you've got these actors, you've got this production company that was let down by their bosses here. And I felt that was out of their hands. So I think I'm going to go with Mutant X. Sorry, Guy. Let me see. You've got to go go for Star Trek. Star Trek, Star Trek. For the same reason that I went with it. Not necessarily. (laughs) Well, um, Newton X had its own problems, okay? I mean, not, not, needs to say that a couple of the actors were absolutely goddamn awful. 
So I'm torn, really, because I've, I need to make a decision as to whether or not that it's a bigger travesty that took so long to, to essentially resolve um, the issues regarding Mutinex or a science fiction series I didn't really watch or like. Um, well, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to go away, watch three seasons of the novel. <laughs> I'm joking. Don't you dare. Uh, <laughs> Watch five seasons of that. No, I'm only joking. No. Um, all right. So really, for me, when you have the high bar of how you should end a, a Star Trek series and you do that, nah, that's got yep, to go in. I agree. So this week we're entering the Star Trek Enterprise finale into our Hall of Shame. If you could sum up that finale in like one word, Guy... And Steve, what would you sum it up as? Abysmal. Yeah. Guy? Pointless. Yeah, I would say pointless. I think it I think I would have rather they ended up on the um episode before this finale, even though it was in the mirror universe. I think that would have been better. So that's it for another episode of the 47th hour. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to follow the podcast. And you can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok at 47 Hour. Thanks for listening.